One form of um, special Kiwi that one gets to interact with on this forum are the um, anti-science left. People who think that being progressive somehow entails a certain scepticism, uh, perhaps hostility towards certain claims about society and politics that issue from the natural sciences. These are the special folk who, whilst not exactly being above comparing people to creationists, are very keen to show up on one's videos or one's commentary whenever one mentions Charles Darwin, evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, or in fact any aspect of the natural sciences that might yield facts that are a little bit uncomfortable to their ideology. Uh, you cited Evo, so, uh, that's rubbish. Before going on immediately to demonstrate they know jack shit about it. But an interesting parallel strikes me between people like that and another group who seem to share similar attitudes. Actually, it struck me as I was walking up that path over there. But anyway, the similarity, I think, is between this kind of anti-science left attitudes and those of early 19th century vitalists. So perhaps there's an interesting story to be told as to how early 19th century vitalism, well, sort of got its comeuppance at the hands of organic chemistry. In the early modern period, you decide whether something was organic, living or non-organic, non-living, by looking what it's made out of and working out whether that stuff was either something that when you heated it up so it lost its shape, it'd get it back when it curled down, which would be the inorganic, or stuff that wouldn't, like trees, squirrels, or me. Because if you heated me up to the point where I lost my shape, I probably wouldn't get it back when I curled down. And this was a category defining difference. There were the things that belonged to the organic category, and there were the things that belonged to the non-organic category, and everything was either one or the other, but not both. And this presupposition of science and study basically stayed in place until, say, the beginning or the beginning to the middle of the 19th century. The interesting kind of moral aspect of this, which sounds rather familiar, because people who did dare to suggest that the organic might have its roots in the non-organic were often severely chastised and accused of wanting to destroy the sanctity of life, to devalue living things, to devalue mind and soul and reduce everybody and everything to mere mechanical process. Yeah, that, that sounds really familiar. She's of course complete bollocks because understanding social, political or even psychological phenomena in terms of our best empirical theories no more undermines the human spirit, human freedom or respect for life than did the demise of vitalism at the hands of organic chemistry, a process which actually started 200 years ago this year in 1816. So it might be instructed to look at what happened then as a potential guide to what might be about to happen. So this is the standing in the middle of the woods with no internet access history of organic chemistry. If I recall rightly, it, belong, it started off with a guy called Michael Chirot, I think his name is, who was a French chemist who was studying soap in the wash your hands and face sense, obviously not in the serialised drama sense, this being 1816 to the early 1820s. And what Chirot showed was that soap, which was at the time organic, because if you remember the film Fight Club, you know, soap used to be made by boiling down um, fat and using lye, like in that film. Not always human fat, to be sure, but sometimes it was. Um, so, soap was organic, but by studying the inorganic, the role of the inorganic com uh, compounds and substances in the quality of soap, Shurel showed that there was a link between the organic and the non-organic. And then there was, of course, the famous Frederick Woolher, who sometimes towards the end of the 1820s, I think it was 1827, 1828, um, managed to synthesize urea, which is the main organic substance in piss or urine. 
sort of reminds me. I'll be back in a sec. There we go. That's better. So yeah, Wulha managed to synthesize urea, the main organic component of urine, from ammonium cyanide, uh, which is inorganic. Now this wasn't the single experiment that killed vitalism, but it was a significant step because what he managed to do was derive the organic from the inorganic. And you weren't supposed to be able to do that. Next was Herman Kolber who managed to synthesize acetic acid, which is the main organic component of vinegar. And by the 1850s, things just went mad. Um, not only did uh, Marcel Botton, is it, uh, lead a team of French chemists who synthesized all manner of uh, organic substances from non-organic ones, but also Kellul and Kupul, I think it is, came up with the tetravalent carbon lattice as an explanatory mechanism, uh, which made it more demonstrative and more scientific. And of course, there was Perkins' famous mauve, which was a massive commercial success in dye making. Actually, he made a purple color uh, when he was trying to synthesize quinine. So, by the 1850s, by 1860, um, things weren't looking that good for vitalism as a necessary assumption for scientific investigation. That's not to say it died out entirely, because it didn't until the beginning of the 20th century, probably. And even people like Louis Pasteur, who, who uh, experiments famously debunked spontaneous emergence of uh, spontaneous generation, even did a sequence of uh, experiments which he claims supported vitalism in some way. But the writing was on the wall. By the middle of the 19th century, the organic and the non-organic certainly did not seem to be properly distinct. The interesting thing here, of course, is that the way this developed, because the early fi findings were accidental, haphazard, lucky even, but then things got more systematic and predictions could be made and theories tested. But the point is the experimental work moved forward and people kind of eventually drifted away from the vitalism. This lead to the mass industrialized slaughter of the 20th century, the horrors of the First and Second World War, the Holocaust, the threat of nuclear annihilation, environmental degradation. I don't think that did. No, I think people find their reasons for being hateful wherever they can. And I don't think you can blame that on organic chemistry, as if it somehow devalued life or devalued the specialness of living things. My advice to certain um, anti-science types is to be wary of ruling out what science can or cannot say before we're actually in a position be able to evaluate where the research might lead and not to think that bad things will necessarily come of the future because we're progressives we're the forward-looking people we if anyone should recognize that thank you for listening